Hey everyone! Today's video is our first one on thermodynamics. I'm going to be talking about Gibbs free energy and the tool of von Toff plots. When thinking about thermodynamics, our goal is really judging the relative energy of different molecules, essentially how stable they are. In physics, one form of energy that's commonly considered is potential energy. For example, you could consider the potential energy of this blob, maybe a rock, at the top of a cliff. This would be considered to have high potential energy. If instead our blob resided lower on the graph, we would say it has lower potential energy. In chemistry, instead we'll consider free energy. I could plot the relative energies of molecules A and B in this graph where my y-axis is Gibbs free energy. Let's consider molecules A and B can interconvert by the following energy pathway, which involves a single barrier. If we're talking about Gibbs free energy, we're just looking at the difference in energy between A and B not the barrier height. We'll get to the barrier height issue when we get to kinetics. It is this Gibbs free energy that is going to determine how much of each compound we have in a solution at equilibrium. We could be looking at two different compounds, like a reactant and a product, or we could be looking at two different conformations of the same compound. For thinking about these mathematically, let's just consider a molecule A interconverting with a product B. Interconverting just means it's converting back and forth between these two forms, A and B. So our equilibrium constant is defined as the concentration of the product, in this case B, over the concentration of the reactant, A here. And our Gibbs free energy is defined as being equal to negative RT natural log of this equilibrium constant. I'm being deliberate and writing delta G naught here to specify that we're considering standard states, but essentially we're specifying that we're considering this delta G at 298 Kelvin or 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure, in the case of gases. And before we move on, I want to talk about the units in this equation. In this class, we're going to work in units of kilocalories per mole for delta G. For these units, our appropriate R constant is going to be 1.98 times 10 to the negative third, with units of kilocalories per Kelvin mole, here your temperature needs to be in Kelvin, and the term natural log of the equilibrium constant is unitless. We really only have three different scenarios for our Gibbs free energy. One of these is if the free energy is less than zero. This will be the case if the products are lower in energy than the reactants. We'll use the term exergonic to describe this scenario. Be careful, exothermic refers to um, enthalpy rather than free energy. Um, we'll be getting to enthalpy soon. Another scenario is that the free energy of the reaction is equal to zero. This will be the case if your reactant and product are of the same Gibbs free energy. We'll term this thermoneutral. And our third scenario is if free energy is positive or greater than zero, and this will be the case if your reactant is higher in energy than your product. Our free energy term is endergonic. Be really careful here, you're just looking at the energies of the starting material and product, not the barrier height here. If you're given a Gibbs free energy value for a reaction, you can always calculate an equilibrium constant at a given temperature, but there's a shortcut we can use to estimate values. 
This is that every 1.4 kilocalories per mole in delta G is worth a factor of an order of magnitude, or 10, in KEQ, particularly at room temperature. So let's consider our reactant and product A and B here. Assume that they're at equilibrium. So first let's consider a thermoneutral reaction with delta G equal to zero. If this is the case, KEQ will equal one, so both reactants and products are equally favored. Our ratio of A to B is one to one, and so you can think about your percent of B as being 50%. All right, so let's consider what if our reaction instead had a delta G of plus 1.4. If delta G is positive 1.4, this means KEQ is an order of magnitude smaller, making it 0.1 instead of 1. This will mean you'll have 10 times as much A as B, meaning the percentage of B would be 9% instead. So we have a pretty dramatic change just going from 0 to 1.4 kilocalories per mole. If instead we had a delta G of negative 1.4, this would be an order of magnitude greater KEQ compared to delta G of zero. So this would be a KEQ of 10. This works out to a one to 10 ratio of A to B, which you can calculate the percent of B as 91%. If we double our delta G, making it negative 2.8, our KEQ gets an order of magnitude higher going to 100. As we make delta G more negative, we shift our equilibrium to favor more of B, so we get a 1 to 100 ratio of A to B, which shifts us to 99% B being present at equilibrium. And if we doubled our negative delta G again to get to a negative 4.2 value, our KEQ would be 1,000, our ratio of A to B would be about 1 to 1,000, and we would have 99.9% .9 B present at equilibrium. Once you get used to thinking of delta G and KEQ in terms of this 1.4 kilocalorie per mole um, relationship, it's going to allow you to really quickly estimate um, how much of a product is favored just given your delta G value without having to do a full calculation. I now wanna talk about temperature effects on Gibbs free energy and equilibrium constant. So notice that this expression for Gibbs free energy features a temperature term. And similarly, if I wanted to rewrite this equation in terms of separating our equilibrium constant, it would look like this. Notice that both our Gibbs free energy and equilibrium constant are temperature dependent. So we could consider two reactions. Imagine one of them having a free energy of negative one kilocalories per mole at room temperature, which is 298 Kelvin, versus a hypothetical separate reaction, which also has a Gibbs free energy of negative one, but that Gibbs free energy is measured at 195 Kelvin instead. So here I've just rewritten those scenarios in a table form. The top one is our room temperature reaction with Gibbs free energy of negative one, and the bottom one is a separate reaction where Gibbs free energy is negative one, but at negative 78 degrees Celsius instead. In the top case, if you calculated the equilibrium constant by the rewritten equation up above, you would get an equilibrium constant of 5.4, which corresponds to a 15 to 85 ratio of starting material A to product B. Having the same free energy value but a lower temperature for the second scenario gives us a higher equilibrium constant of 13.2, corresponding to a 7 to 93 ratio of A to B. Essentially, what this means is we need to be careful about specifying and thinking about 
particular temperatures when we're talking about Gibbs free energy or equilibrium constants, because they will change with temperature. We can consider other components of Gibbs free energy. Delta G is related to the change in enthalpy and the change in entropy by the equation delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. Delta H is our enthalpy term. The units will be the same as those for free energy and we'll use kilocalories per mole. And we're going to think about enthalpy changes as reflecting how bond strengths or interactions between molecules change in a reaction. We'll use the term exothermic if delta H is less than zero, or endothermic if delta H is greater than zero. Delta S represents our change in entropy for a reaction. And the units we're going to use are called EU. This stands for entropy units. This is in calories per mole Kelvin. Entropy can be thought of as a measure of how disordered a system is. And this will become important and have a greater contribution to the free energy overall at higher temperatures. And in terms of disorder, we're going to think about three different types of degrees of freedom for a molecule. So first I'll talk about enthalpy. Unless a reaction is thermoneutral, we're going to think about whether or not our reaction is releasing heat or taking it in from the surroundings. One method we can use to estimate the change in enthalpy for a reaction is to use bond dissociation energies. This is a measure of how much energy is required to cause a homolytic bond cleavage. So for a bond between A and B, I am breaking that bond and sending one electron to A, one to B, giving me an A radical and a B radical. It's going to take energy in order to break this bond. And this amount of energy can be experimentally measured. To calculate the change in enthalpy for a reaction, you're going to take a sum of the bond dissociation energies for bonds broken minus the sum of bond dissociation energies for bonds formed. So let's consider a hypothetical reaction where we have a methane molecule reacting with hydrogen peroxide to form methanol and water. Here I'm showing you key bond dissociation energies that we're going to need for our calculation. In my reaction, I'm breaking the carbon-hydrogen bond and the oxygen-oxygen bond, and I'm forming a carbon-oxygen bond and an oxygen-hydrogen bond. My calculated change in enthalpy for this reaction would be negative 55 kilocalories per mole. This tells me that I predict this reaction to be exothermic. However, a limitation is that we have no information here about how fast this reaction would go or any information at all about the reaction mechanism for this. We just know that if this reaction occurred, heat would be released. For considering entropy and degrees of freedom, we're going to consider how molecules or atoms can move in reactants or products. And we'll separate three different types of degrees of freedom, translational, rotational, and vibrational. Translational is how an atom or molecule can move through space. So we could consider a phase change from a solid to a gas. Gases have more movements through space available, giving them a higher entropy. So this reaction would have a positive change in entropy. Alternatively, we could consider one molecule breaking apart into two molecules. Two molecules will have more ways in which they can move compared to one molecule. 
giving our separated molecules a higher entropy than our single molecule starting material, giving us a positive delta S value. In terms of rotational freedom, this has to do with how many conformations our molecule can access. And one important way in which we'll see this come into place is if we have a linear molecule compared to a cyclic one. A linear molecule is going to have access to more possible conformations than a cyclic one, where we've tied our atoms together and limited their rotations. So cyclic molecules will have lower entropy compared to linear ones, making for this hypothetical reaction delta S less than zero, or negative. The last type of degree of freedom is vibrational. This has to do with internal motions of atoms within a single molecule. And I won't talk much about this because it is quite complex. The last topic for the video has to do with how you would determine your Gibbs free energy changes in enthalpy or entropy for a reaction, assuming you didn't have any of these values starting out. And the way to do this is to generate what's known as a Van de Hoff plot. What you would do in the lab is you would perform a series of experiments where you would measure the equilibrium constant for your reaction at different temperatures. You could do this using a tool like spectroscopy. If your molecules had different proton NMR spectra, you could look for how much of the starting material versus the product was present in your NMR sample at a given temperature. Something like infrared spectroscopy would also work well here. So you've measured equilibrium constants and know at what temperature you did those measurements, but how do you process this data? So we're going to start out with our two different um, equations for Gibbs free energy, delta H minus T delta S and minus RT ln KEQ. Notice that both of these have delta G on the left side. What we can do is take the right sides of each of these equations and set them equal to each other. This would give us minus RT natural log of KEQ as being equal to delta H minus T delta S. What I'm going to do next is try to separate out the natural log of KEQ portion. To get rid of the minus RT in front of it, I would divide everything by minus RT. On the left side, my minus RT on the top and on the bottom would cancel. Nothing cancels for my delta H term, but for the entropy term, I have minus T canceling on the top and bottom. This would give me natural log of the equilibrium constant as being equal to negative delta H over RT. Here I've separated out the temperature term by writing one over T. And then I would have plus delta S over R. This equation is now written in such a way that I could imagine my Y axis as being the natural log of the equilibrium constant, my X axis as being one over the temperature, and my graph would give me a slope equal to negative delta H over R and an intercept of delta S over R. Here I've rewritten the same equation from before and started my graph where I have natural log of equilibrium constant versus one over the temperature. As I mentioned before, in the lab, you would be measuring equilibrium constants at a given temperature and then you could take the natural log of the equilibrium constant and take one divided by the temperature to plot your data like this. Ideally, your data could be fitted to a line. The slope of the line will be equal to negative delta H over R. So you could calculate delta H by multiplying your slope by R 
and the intercept of your graph would give you positive delta s over r. So you could calculate delta s by multiplying the intercept by r. A few notes on this Van Hoff technique. In the majority of scenarios, you'll be measuring your temperatures somewhat close to room temperature, probably somewhere between negative 100 Celsius and positive 200 Celsius, let's say. Because you get the entropy by extrapolating back over a large amount of temperature, it is more error prone than the enthalpy term, which can be determined where you actually perform your measurement at those temperatures. An assumption of this technique is that your change in enthalpy and change of entropy are temperature independent. This is usually a reasonable assumption. This plot doesn't give you the Gibbs free energy directly, but once you've calculated delta H and delta S, you can use those to calculate Gibbs free energy at a certain temperature, usually room temperature. And I know I said it before, but I'll say it one last time. The Gibbs free energy that you calculate is going to be temperature dependent. Even though our terms for enthalpy and entropy are treated as temperature independent. So to summarize, this video talked about some of the topics of thermodynamics. I talked about Gibbs free energy and equilibrium constant. I also discussed enthalpy and entropy terms and talked about the experimental technique of the Van Hoff plot, which would allow you to experimentally determine values for delta G, delta H, and delta S. That's it for this video. I will see you in class.